Professor Reisner is at Cambridge. Um, he'll be talking about the uh, photo reforming of plastics to fuel and platform chemicals. Um, he's also the PI of the uh, Cambridge Creative Circular pa Plastic Center, CCCPC. Um, and with that, I will let him speak. <laughs> Great, thanks a lot, Bruce, for the very kind words and also to Corinne and Josie from the Catalysis Hub for inviting me and having me. Let me just get ready here. Can you see full screen in presenter mode? Yes, it's good. Perfect. Okay, so the, the title of my talk is Solar Synthesis of Fuels and Chemicals from Biomass and Plastic Waste. Um, my group historically works on solar fuels and solar chemicals. So we try to use sunlight to generate energy carriers like hydrogen or convert carbon dioxide to useful fuels. And we more by accident fell into polymer conversion maybe five to six years ago. And today I'd really like to give you a bit of a background of the motivation of the work, give a bit of an introduction on semiconductor photocatalysis that is required for this, and then just show a couple of simple systems uh, that we employed to convert plastic and biomass into useful chemicals, but also hydrogen. So what is really our vision for solar chemistry in a circular economy? So we, we really look at sustainable inputs. Um, of course, as a solvent, water will be very attractive. As a, as a liquid, we also look quite carefully into sea and polluted sources. Then we look quite a bit into air, which means greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. And then really the protagonist of today is polymer waste. And with polymer waste, I really mean also biomass, lignocellulosic waste. And we've heard quite a bit about plastics already by the two fantastic previous speakers. And with these inputs, we then, oh, before I go into it, this is just a, a picture, actually, the first excursion from a subgroup of mine to the uh, Cambridge recycling facilities. And what you see at the back here is really from the, the plastic recycling, the plastic that cannot be recycled. So this is all lined up for landfill. And this is just from a weekend. And if you look closely into the plastics, you will also find a lot of plastics you could argue are easily to mechanically recycle like PET, PET and many others. So that there's a big challenge to overcome. And the chemistry I will be talking about today is really solar powered chemistry. And I will only focus on suspension systems in interest of time. So little semiconducting particles that can take the light and can drive chemical reactions. And then with the inputs, we can use this solar energy then to release hydrogen, ammonia from nitrogen. I will not talk about that at all. And I will also barely talk about CO2 reduction to make carbon monoxide and formic acid. But ultimately, our vision is to use all of these vectors, ultimately then to go into the chemical industry and produce really useful products. So this can be synthetic fuels. For example, if you have hydrogen and carbon monoxide, you can make green kerosene or hydrocarbons. If you have green hydrogen, you can make ammonia or green fertilizers. And ultimately, we want to go into the chemical industry to contribute to the production of plastics, pharma, and materials. If you get the catalysis right, you could also go straight from the resources to these products without the intermediate feedstocks. But again, today, this is just a lot of proof of concept chemistry to show that this chemistry can, in principle, work. Uh, we are certainly not at commercial level yet, and there's still quite a long way to go. But I still hope you find it exciting to use photochemistry here for um, plastics or biomass upcycling or recycling. And of course, the nice thing is if you have these products, even in the worst case scenario, if you just burn them off or, or throw them away, you just regain your, your resources. So it's, it's a circular approach here. So how does a semiconductor photochemistry work and how can you use it to make energy carriers? So first of all, you have a semiconducting particle with a defined band gap, so a valence band and a conduction band. You hit it in our case with sunlight and this promotes an electron from the, from the valence to the conduction band. This electron can then be used because it's, it's highly reducing to reduce protons, for example, to hydrogen. And these protons would be used from, from water. And hydrogen, of course, is an interesting energy carrier for a hydrogen economy. The big question is, where do all of these electrons come from? And usually in the, in the community of solar fuels, this would be coupled to the oxidation of water to oxygen. So this is a four electron pro process, releases all these electrons that you can use for hydrogen generation. And you also gain here the protons you also need for hydrogen. So it's a nicely 
a closed system where ultimately you take H2O to hydrogen and oxygen. And this is overall a highly endothermic reaction, so a positive Gibbs free energy. And this is why we need the solar energy. This can be extended to different reactions. We can also think about carbon dioxide conversion to carbon monoxide, for example, or as I mentioned, nitrogen fixation to ammonia. Um, so this would be really broadly speaking today, the solar fuels field. But what I want to talk today is really the, the question, do we even want this oxygen? So is it really necessary to produce all these fuels coupled to the oxidation of water? And the problem we face, or why this may not be the, the ideal idea, is because the oxygen generation is really challenging. And what I mean with challenging, it's not only kinetically challenging, coupling these four electrons and four protons I mentioned before, but it's also thermodynamically difficult. Again, we need a lot of energy input. Another issue is oxygen is quite reactive and requires separation. So if you think about a one pot, a pot system where you generate oxygen, of course, this can react with photo excited states, can back react at the reductive side, or could even react with the hydrogen because you're forming a knall gas. So really, the earlier you separate with a membrane, or even by in situ generation physically separate from oxygen and hydrogen, would be much beneficial. And ultimately, also, if you think about value creation in this process, oxygen is of limited commercial value, at least in most um, applications. So there's clearly space to think about alternative oxidation chemistry. And this is really how we started to think about alternative oxidation reactions, and specifically to this meeting here about lignocellulose and plastics. So you can already see the hint. What we are doing here is replacing the water oxidation reaction by conversion oxidation of waste substrates. So here again, this plot shows us to think about scalability and process value when we replace water oxidation by waste or other oxidation chemistry. So if we have here again on x-axis process value, on the y-axis scalability, and we oxidize water to oxygen, it's amazing from a scalability point of view. There really is sufficient water, in fact, a far excess of water to produce all the hydrogen you could wish for to drive the, the planet. But the problem is, as I pointed out before, you're not really creating a lot of value because you're just making oxygen. There is a bit of a case to oxidize water to hydrogen peroxide, but I won't discuss this today. So on the other extreme would be oxidation of chemicals, doing fine chemical or possibly bulk chemical synthesis. This is really attractive from a process value point of view. This is why there's this big organic community on photoredox catalysis. But the scalability is really holding us back. There's only so much fine chemicals you need to make a certain hydrogen, and this hydrogen will not be enough to be a meaningful contributor for a hydrogen economy. And we thought there could be a sweet spot where organic waste, being significant in scale, because there's a lot of biomass and plastic waste, can also create a significant amount of process value if we can derive good or useful organic chemicals. So this is really where scalability and process value uh, are in, a, in, in an attractive position, and that's why we started to work on this. So that's really, in brief, the concept of today or the process I will be discussing. Four components are needed. One, your waste input, biomass or plastic. You are in an, or we are in an aqueous solution. We have a photocatalyst that can take up the light and drive the chemistry. And last but not least, we have solar energy. And then in almost all systems I will describe, we make hydrogen, with one exception, um, where we discuss CO2 conversion. And also from the oxidation, we can source chemicals. And these chemicals will largely depend on the photocatalyst or the co-catalyst and, of course, the substrate we're using here. But then, generally speaking, very often we create a, a range of different organic acids. And that's surely, surely one of the chemistry that still needs to be refined. So the, the systems I'll be discussing today, the chemistry is far from selective. So we always produce a range of different chemicals, which is far from ideal. Really, this, this project was started by Moritz Kühnel, who is now a senior lecturer at Swansea University, and David Wakely is now a startup company on CO2 electrolysis. And the idea was exactly what I described. Can we just feed in biomass into the photocatalyst, oxidize the biomass to, we do not want to have ultimately CO2, but this was the starting point, and couple this to the reduction of water to hydrogen. And the polymer we, we focused on first was lignocellulose. And the reason is because it's the most abundant form of biomass. So again, we have plenty available on the planet. And importantly, there's no competition with agriculture because we cannot digest or break down lignocellulose. So it's a proper waste product from farming, and there are no issues in terms of uh, competition with agriculture. 
The issue is it's chemically inert. Of course, it has evolved to be a very robust substrate and it's also hardly soluble. So if we think about the solution process, of course, we would prefer to have a soluble substrate rather than something that is, sits as a solid in the solution. And just as a reminder here on the bottom is the structure of lignocellulose. In the core, we have the crystalline cellulose structure, uh, the, the polysugar, polyglucose. Then we have the amorphous hemicellulose, which is also a polysugar compound here, polysaccharide. And lignin is this uh, polyphenolic compound that is really wrapped around the cellulose and the hemicellulose to provide protection. And this is also a very attractive feedstock to, to source aromatic compounds. I will not show anything about lignin today. I will focus about cellulose and hemicellulose. Lignin is a bit more difficult. We have first nice results now, um, but again, for simplicity, I will focus on, on the cellulosic biomass. So what is another aspect that's really attractive of the biomass reforming compared to water splitting or water oxidation? And it really is the thermodynamic requirement. So I mentioned before that water oxidation is challenging. And if we couple water oxidation to proton reduction, we have a quite a positive Gibbs free energy. So it turns out if we replace the water with biomass, or let's say as a model glucose oxidation, we are almost thermoneutral. So the Gibbs free energy is close to zero. And this is simply because our substrate contains already a lot of energy. All we are doing in the photochemical reaction is unlock the energy from the glucose and simply put into the hydrogen. So this means if we look about solar light utilization, we see here on the top the solar spectrum, we are not constrained to maybe the UV and blue light. As for water splitting, we can go far further into the visible light and so harvest much more of the photons and actually produce much more product of hydrogen that we could with the coupling or, or with water oxidation. And of course, in addition to this, we mitigate waste and also create potentially value from the oxidation chemistry. Last but not least, what we really want to do is, is source organics from the oxidation. But even if we fully completely oxidize to carbon dioxide, we actually uh, produce a very concentrated stream of CO2, which can either be sequestered by carbon capture and sequestration or can be utilized also by the reduction reaction. And that benefit, again, is in a closed system. Our concentration of CO2 would be very high, which is a significant advantage over, let's say, uh, direct air capture from atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. So we are not the first thinking about this. In fact, this area of research has been going for decades with the first pioneering work by Kawe and Sakata. And they showed you could put um, biomass related substrates with, into a titania semiconductor with platinum, oxidize the biomass and reduce water to hydrogen. But since the 80s, when it comes to really polymeric, real world polymers, all publications pretty much used titanium dioxide with platinum or other noble metals as co-catalyst. And there is the, the limitations by such a system is that you can really only use UV light. Titanium dioxide is a wide band semiconductor with a conduction band of about 3.2 electron volts. So only a few percent of the solar light will really be utilized. Second, it requires precious metals, as I mentioned, platinum or ruthenium. And lastly, also the conversion rates and yields were actually quite modest. So it was not a very efficient system. It was just a proof of concept that this actually works. So we were really curious to see if we can actually um, address these limitations and maybe look at visible light absorbing systems that are, do not require precious metals and operate at much higher efficiency. And we were drawn by a publication by the Feldman Group of LMU in Munich. And they have shown if you take cadmium sulfide quantum dots and put them into an alkaline solution, they form actually a stabilizing oxide hydroxide shell. And if you photo excite these particles, you can reduce water to hydrogen. And they showed already some oxidation chemistry with methanol. So we thought, would this be an attractive system for our biomass? Because also the biomass, of course, was hydrolyzed under the alkaline conditions. And this indeed was the starting point. I'm showing Moritz and, and David again. And I will get straight to the, the polymers. And we could see that really alpha cellulose, if you take it into the solution with the cadmium sulfide alkaline conditions, you generate hydrogen. The same with hemicellulose and a little bit of lignin as well. So the lignin, again, is much more tricky. It doesn't hydrolyze the same way than the cellulose. So the conversions are, are much more limited. Here is a, a range of real world samples from printer paper, cardboard, wooden branch, grass, sawdust, etc. And you can see that all of this lignocellulose containing substrate really produced um, a good amount of hydrogen. What I show here on the left is just a video to show you how simple the system is. 
Um, we have here a little branch of wood in a test tube. So this is about one centimeter across. The yellow color comes from the cadmium sulfide quantum dots. So quantum dots I didn't introduce actually are nano-sized photocatalysts. And as the, the yellow takes up the light and approaches the wood, it starts actually oxidizing the wood. So oxidizing the wood to break down into organic acids. And at the same time, it starts using the electrons to generate hydrogen. So this, this, this vigorous bubble formation here is from hydrogen evolution from or really on the wood stem, if you like. So it's quite an efficient system. So we were quite excited about this result. Um, and so were also the, uh, the organizers of Expo 2017 in Astana. And they approached us with the idea to have a little pavilion where children can put, pick up some biomass and actually photoreform um, the biomass to, to make some hydrogen, which clearly is a very nice outreach demonstration. Of course, you, you may see the problems already. Children handling 10 molar KOH and cadmium turned out not to be the best idea. So we, we only ended up with a little TV screen, but of course it mo motivated us to address these major limitations. And th the first step here was really by Artich Kasab. What she did is she used carbon nitride um, semiconductor-like photocatalyst. So these are organic polymers with a, with a reasonably defined band gap, a homolumo gap, and they also turn out to be able to degrade um, the, the biomass here. Uh, I won't get into the details of the, of the polymer, happy to discuss in more detail later, but what turns out to be important are the cyanamide groups that have a very high affinity for alcohols and really turned out to be very efficient for the cellulose oxidation and also ultrasonication to break them down in very stable colloidal systems that actually they could approach, approach also the biomass. And in this photocatalyst, um, requires a co-catalyst to generate hydrogen. And what we used here is a molecular co-catalyst. This is known as nickel P. It's a bisdiphosphate nickel catalyst. And what we have done is we phosphonated this catalyst and this turned out to be a good hydrogen evolution catalyst in aqueous solution. And the nice thing is that this system now also works in aqueous solution uh, and at much more modest pH values. So this pH is 4.5 here. And if we take the cellulose, we see some hydrogen formation. It's not huge. Again, keep in mind, we still have now a hetero, heterogeneous photocatalyst substrate interface. So the efficiency is not high. If we take soluble model uh, substrates, the efficiency goes up a lot. The same is true for xylene or hemicellulose. The polymeric form is efficiency is low. If we go down to the dimeric monomeric uh, equivalents, we have high efficiency and we have a small amount of lignin activity here as well. Then further to address the point or the limitation of this heterogeneous photocatalyst, heterogeneous substrate interface, um, we looked at other light absorbers of photocatalysts. And um, Demetra Achilleos here um, developed this, uh, this uh, carbon dot systems for the biomass breakdown. So this carbon dots, uh, actually TM images shown on the right, are a few nanometer uh, carbon balls. In this case here, this is an sp3 carbon dot that's doped with nitrogen, which turned out to be quite a good photocatalyst. Also here, I'm happy to discuss more properties later if there, there are questions. And we can, many, can make many different forms of carbon dots, and we can even make them from cellulose waste. So you can just burn off cellulose in the furnace. You use this to make the carbon dots, and these cellulose-derived carbon dots can then photocatalytically degrade biomass or cellulose into organic acids again with the co-generation of hydrogen from, from aqueous solution here. And also here we are under, under benign pH conditions to drive this, this photochemistry. Um, here are some results. Because these carbon dots are really soluble now, we do not see much difference anymore in activity between the polymeric cellulose and the model substrates that are soluble. So again, this shows now this homogeneous photocatalyst form a much better interface with the polymers than what we had before with, with the carbon nitrides. One system I'd, I'd show what we achieved recently or better from Erwin Lahm here to really couple this photodegradation of cellulose with carbon dioxide reduction. And there are two challenges. So first of all, the CO2 reduction requires close to neutral pH. Um, this is mainly due to the catalyst, but also the amount of dissolved CO2. Uh, we don't want to trap all the substrate of CO2 as a carbonate. And also we require biomass depolymerization. Again, this is tricky at neutral pH um, if we do not have a perfectly soluble photocatalyst. And how we addressed this problem was actually with, is in a two-step approach. So first of all, we looked for a photocatalyst that could reduce carbon dioxide. And we stepped actually back here to titanium dioxide. And we found that titanium dioxide with a co-immobilized cobalt bisteridine reduces carbon dioxide 
uh, with protons to carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So this is syngas. Uh, I will also not discuss detail of this cobalt catalyst, but for the coordination chemist in the audience, you may not, this does not look like a catalyst, but what happens is here when we reduce to cobalt one, actually the saturation of the coordination sphere is broken and one of the pyridine opens up a vacant site. And then the CO2 can actually attack um, the cobalt center and we enter the catalytic cycle. But in the first uh, test reactions, we used a sacrificial electron donor just to establish the half reaction of CO2 reduction. And in this case, this is triacinol amine, which we oxidize to triacinol amine radical. But this, of course, is not a meaningful oxidative reaction. So how do we couple this to biomass oxidation? And this is the first time we coupled um, this photochemistry to enzyme pretreatment. And what we can do, because we required this neutral pH solutions, we just took cellul cellulose and pretreated this with cellulase. So as the name says, the enzyme that breaks down cellulose and to convert the cellulose to cellobios, this a dimer here that's soluble and also glucose. And after this pretreatment, we could simply replace the TOA, oxidize the soluble um, sugars here, or saccharides, and form arabinose and formate. And this actually was quite a clean system. We, we noticed from isotopic labeling that formate is formed from the oxidation exclusively, and we have CO exclusively from the reduction reaction. So this slide has been shown already uh, before. So I will not repeat it again. What we wanted to do now is um, use the technologies or systems we have for lignocellulose or cellulose uh, photo reforming to produce hydrogen and also use this in the context of, of plastic reforming. And this is work from Taylor Uckert. Um, she was also already on one of the slides, in fact, by Bruce. And she was a PhD student in my group and she worked on this plastic photo reforming project. And what it is, it's exactly the same as we had before from the lignocellulose just that we used the cadmium sulfide and alkaline solution as a starting point and just what we're feeding in plastics and specifically uh, PET. So what you can see on the left here is this similar what I've shown before with the uh, wooden stem. We have just a test tube uh, with a little piece of PET. So this really just comes from a, is cut out from a plastic bottle. And we covered this PET with cadmium sulfide particles, put it into alkaline solution and irradiated with light. And you can see here again, the bubbles really form on the PET as it oxidizes PET and the electrons are being used for hydrogen generation. This works for a number of different uh, plastics, but in particular, it works well for condensation polymers. And that's probably no surprise because the condensation polymers hydrolyze very nicely under the alkaline conditions, form the monomers we can break down. Um, in, the, in the case of PET, acetylene glycol, for example, and this is nice to oxidize and act as an electron donor for our photocatalytic process. So what I'm showing here is the hydrogen evolution uh, with different substrates. PLA is shown here, hydrolyzes nicely. The same with PET and the real PET bottle. Polyurethane is already not so great. And if we go to um, addition polymers such as polyethylene, et cetera, we get essentially no hydrogen generation because the pretreatment doesn't work and we cannot quite unlock the electrons from the plastic waste. Here, this is the one plot just to show you the stability. So all of the systems, including of the cellulose, these are not just systems that operate for a couple of minutes or hours. We can really drive these at least for a week. And you can see this here with PET. And usually we stop after six days just because we are limited on our solar light simulators that we're using for this work. So I haven't mentioned this before, but all the, the light you see is simulated solar light, which essentially uh, mimics the solar spectrum. So it, it's an, an, a fair comparison with outdoor irradiation. Also here we have moved on. So instead of cadmium sulfide, we can also use a carbon nitride um, polymer photocatalyst. In this case, we replaced now this molecular nickel catalyst by nickel phosphide hydrogen evolution catalyst. This can just be deposited on the carbon nitride. So we have an integrated light absorber with a co-catalyst. And also here, when we photo excite the carbon nitride, um, we extract the charge from the plastics and generate the electrons for hydrogen generation. Here's just one of these systems where we can see hydrogen yield over time. And what you can see is the polyester microfibers work really well. And that may not be surprising because, again, there are already very small particles that, that can be breaking down. So we have very easy access to our substrates. If we use a BET bottle, we see a bit of reduced activity. And if the BET is contaminated with some soybean oil, we also see activity. So there's one very important point to make here with this photocatalysis. We can use different plastics. We can use different cellulose. 
And we can also use contaminated waste. So if there's some food waste on plastic, we can also photo reform it because the process really breaks down almost anything in the process. Of course, this adds to the diversity of our products from the oxidation, but at least the photocatalysis um, works and, and proceeds. What you can see here on the left is already a larger reactor in the group. So this is about 150 milliliters. And we were very proud of this, this scaling achievement. But of course, in industry, this is tiny scale. So what I'm showing is here on the right hand side, this is the re-oil facility of OMV. Um, we have collaborated with this oil and gas company for several years. And what I'm showing here is really a, a, a thermal uh, reactor that converts plastic into oil. And this reactor produces uh, uses about 100 kilo of plastics to generate 100 liters of oil per hour. So of course, it seems almost hopeless to, to compare and compete these two processes. But if you look into the details, it turns out these two do not compete. They're very complementary because what this re-oil facility uh, uses is exactly this polymers we cannot use for photo reforming, such as addition polymers, so polyethylene, polypropylene, and it really needs clean plastics. On the other hand, the photo reforming uses the condensation polymers, PET, PLA, et cetera, and these are the polymers that the re-oil facility cannot use. And we can also use contaminated waste. So the idea would be here, hopefully, in the long term, to develop those side by side. And of course, if we can use a thermal process and make it sustainable, this is clearly a step ahead or several steps ahead. If there's waste that cannot be treated otherwise, I guess first by mechanical cycling, second by established chemical recycling procedures, maybe there is scope for photochemistry. Here, what we have done in, as a last um, step is it turns out that these colloidal systems are not ideal um, because when we break down the waste and we have residues, all the, the photocatalysts are essentially stuck with these residues. So what we are doing now is we are developing flow systems where we have a pretreatment chamber to really break down the plastic. We flow it into the photoreactor. And now we don't have a suspension of the photoreactor. We actually deposit the photocatalysts on solid substrates or glass. And you can really make in your photoreactor, the glass window can be the glass window with co-deposited photocatalysts. So in this case, we flush in the degraded or the depolymerized substrate. And then the, um, when it touches the window, it gets broken down into organics that you can flush out. And in the headspace, you form the hydrogen. And also here we see the hydrogen versus time. And this also works for municipal solid waste. So this is really turbid, opaque waste from real um, uh, treatment plants. And because the window allows us that the irradiation hits the photocatalyst before it goes through the solution, actually even a colored solution is not an issue for our system. So with colloids, if of course they're dispersed in solution, a colored solution would compete with light absorption of the photocatalyst. But in this case, the window is first exposed to the light, takes the light, and actually what happens then in solution doesn't matter anymore. So only really the photons that are not being absorbed by the photocatalyst will reach the solution phase in the system. And this works in pure aqueous solution and also in seawater, for example. So again, just to demonstrate, it's quite robust, this system. So I'm coming to the end. I think I'm running out of time at this stage. Um, it was already mentioned in the introduction that we have a Cambridge Circular Plastic Center, surplus in Cambridge, so I will also not go into the details here, but it just really has a very broad range of activity. It spans about eight departments and really looks at many different aspects of, of the plastic challenge. Uh, and it's a great team and it has been a pleasure to work with them. So the, the summary, again, the idea of, of using polymeric substrates, break them down with photocatalysts to generate hydrogen and chemicals. You may wonder what really are the potential applications, considering this is such an early stage technology and what would be the market niche potentially. Here are a few thoughts. First, I think it's interesting to think about this in the context of, of wet and mixed waste streams. So if you think, for example, of wet biomass, a thermal process, you have a huge energy penalty just to dry that wood, for example. And in this case, in an aqueous process, this is no issue whatsoever. Then I think this photo reforming is good for small and off-grid applications. You do not need large centralized facilities. In principle, this could work at almost any scale and even small off-grid may be preferred over large scale centralized. We can produce clean gas. I've not mentioned this before, but our hydrogen is really free of contaminants. So this means it should be fuel cell grade and can be potentially directly used in a fuel cell. Um, we also find it's interesting to think about uh, biomass conversion in particular for clean cooking applications. So dirty cooking is a, is a major issue in developing country. Uh, the, the 
uh, die about three to four million people per year. And we were thinking maybe this could be used potentially, many challenges ahead, no doubt, to generate hydrogen for, for clean cooking here. Clinical waste removal is also interesting, again, because this is high value uh, waste mitigation. And if people are concerned about the uh, alkaline pH value we are using in most systems, actually there are some natural waste streams that are highly alkaline. So for example, paper mill effluents um, with cellulose are such a waste stream, and we could potentially just couple it to there to valorize the stream. This is it really. The, I've shown a few people who have been involved, but of course it's a great team we have in the, in the lab. Thanks to the funders. I'd also like to point out, I uh, also have open positions. So if you are someone who enjoys running a lab or managing a lab, I look for a lab manager. I look for postdocs and PhD studentships and I welcome applications, of course. And at the very, very end, for those of you interested in, in enzymes or, or whole cell systems for in the energy context, we will be having a workshop end of March in Cambridge, uh, which is a biophotoelectrochemical systems workshop with many fantastic speakers. If you're interested, just look at my website. There's a link to this conference. That's all I wanted to share with you. I'm happy to take questions, and I'm looking forward to the discussion.